Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I'm excited about this morning for a number of reasons. Um, not because Pastor Rick isn't teaching and continuing his series, series in Revelation. Because that's a great um, series and uh, we're just watching uh, the end times just on a daily basis. So it's a blessing to go through Revelation. But I knew um, several weeks ago that I was going to be able to share during this time. And um, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from the team that went to Israel which should excite you um, because you don't have to listen to me the whole time. But uh, also because, um, you know, God uh, just is unbelievable. Pastor Rick hurt his back, and so he's not here this morning. So I'm going to ask that you join me in prayer over him right now. So let's pray for Pastor Rick. Father, right now we do lift up Pastor Rick to you. Um, We just care about this uh, man, this pastor, Father, and we pray that you would touch him and prepare the words for Resurrection Sunday as he studies this week. So Lord, just bless him, watch over him, and bless this service that your name would be glorified. Well, this morning to start with, I'm going to uh, bring up the team from Israel that went a few weeks ago, and they're going to have an opportunity to share with you about um, something that's special to them. Now, they only get a minute and a half to share. And so when I was preparing my message, um, I was thinking, okay, an hour or 10 minutes, because there's a lot of people that can share a lot of words in a short period of time. Uh, but I want you to hear their heart uh, and what they saw. So if that team would come up, and as they're coming up, um, one of the things I want to share with you, this message actually came to me when I was in um, Israel. Um, as we walked in what was called the Valley of Allah, um, the Lord just spoke to my heart. And so um, um, I want you to know that uh, I want to see they were like that over there, too. Um, I just want you to know that uh, it was a blessing to be over there. And God speaks to our heart in those places uh, when we um, are standing in in um, ground that uh, is truly blessed. So who has the mic? Oh, well, since we're on this side, Miguel gets to go forth. One story about Miguel. Miguel was our map in Israel. See, that was a perfect, that was a perfect picture of him. And in the Valley of Elah, um, our guide was going through and sharing all the places that we were at. So, okay. Yes. Okay. So timing go. <laughs> Wall of 
Temple Mount. And we were sitting in the place where we know that the Lord was teaching. And that was the time that he moved me. I got baptized into Jordan. And, and, and it was special. But when I sat down and got stuck, and, and I could think back and say, <coughs> the Lord was here. Um, that was really special. And, and, and you know, and then we went to, to Magdala. And, and to experience the places that we know that he touched and the places where he taught and, and, and the, the witnessing of those old walks in the floor and, and navigating on, in the Sea of Galilee and thinking what he would see and say <coughs> you have to go you just have to go and you'll be happy with her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take only 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. Uh, I think for me, not only was I excited with the thought of going, but to be there, it truly just took me to another level. I think one of the things that I did that I was so excited every single minute of the day that I took so <laughs> many pictures. <laughs> Guys, 2,060 some hundred pictures I took. I wanted to just capture every single second. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I wanted to just keep everything here. And I think like Miguel is saying, you know, being there is seeing what the Lord was seeing. It just brings the gospel to life. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I can say that um, it just deepened my faith. Mm -hmm. And the relationship I have with the Lord. That's what I can say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was such a joy to get to see um, these two, and, and these two that have not been before, to see it through their eyes. That was such a blessing. It still is when I hear them speaking about it. But um, Miguel said something about being so happy when he was there, and I truly believe that, you know, it talks about that in God's presence, presence is fullness of joy. And he's there. He's. We know he's everywhere, but it's it's almost this sense of he's home. And our tour guide mentioned to me that, you know, he he lives within us, and it's almost as if, as if he's excited to be home when you're there, and you feel that excitement, that joy within you. He explained it almost like, you know, when Elizabeth, uh, when Mary came in, and the baby within Elizabeth left within. He said he felt like that, almost like a, like a take it away his breath kind of a feeling, you know. And, and I can attest to that too. Just this wonderful feeling of that he is, he's there and he's with me. And he has this way with me, tell a really quick story, of, of showing me his presence. One time I asked him specifically, show me, Lord, that you're here with me. And he had a butterfly that that started following me. And all of a sudden I realized, that's that's it. It's, it's this butterfly. And um, so then we went to a restaurant. We were in Sedona at the time. And the waiter took us to our table. And we were outside, and they were all covered with white tablecloths. And here was this butterfly sitting on the table, only on my table, and sat there almost the entire dinner. And so when we were um, in Nazareth, and we were up on this high pinnacle looking over at this town where Jesus grew up. I thought of the things like that Jesus probably played there as a little boy. And, um, but we, as we were sharing scriptures, it was really windy. Everybody, if you remember that, I mean, it was like taking your wig off kind of thing. 
And, um, and so the, our tour guide was talking to us in front of us and sharing the word. And, and all of a sudden, here's these two butterflies. And Rebecca saw them. We were both crying because she knows my story about butterflies. And they were able to just kind of stay there and play around his head and, and while he's reading. And I'm, I mean, the wind is like, you know, <laughs> and you think a butterfly, <laughs> but they were able just to stay there. And afterwards, we talked about that and how special that was. But um, even beyond that, you know, what was really special to me this time, I think, was just getting to um, share and and converse with the Jewish people. Almost every day, we had a chance to either have a speaker or. Uh, also, this this guy that was our tour guide, uh, his name's alone, and God really put it on my heart because he, he's a Jew and he doesn't know the Lord to to really pray for him. And the Lord gave me an opportunity while we were there to witness to him in this really interesting place. It's on uh, of the north of uh, Caesarea of Philippi. It's called Basan, and it, it, in the past, it had been a really demonic place. Um, there were actual uh, demonic temples built in this place and you could see where they were and, and while we were there I got a chance to talk to him and share my faith with him and um, but he he still believes that it has so much to do with, with earning your way to heaven and what you do you know and, and I said to him do you really think anybody's good enough alone to, to make their way to heaven you know on their own and um, so I just ask that you be praying. You know, Randy talks about pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And part of the peace of Jerusalem is that they come to know that their Messiah is here. And that he loves them and wants them to um, be with him forever in heaven. And so that's my, my request. Is when you think of Randy's in your ear... Um, and sometimes that's good and bad, but um, when you hear him here and he says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for alone. It's easy to remember. Alone right now is alone because he doesn't have Jesus. Yeah. And just pray for alone that he will come to know the Lord. She's going to go last. Um, for us, um, we've been there several times two weeks ago, so every time that we've gone, it's been something different. And this is the same thing for us. It opened our eyes more to the surroundings, um, really opened up the Bible. You read something in the Bible, and I know before I went prior, but my first time, I would read something in my vision, this is what it looks like. And then you get to the actual site, and it's like totally, totally different. And it just now makes the Bible just pop. Because when you read something, it's like, I've been there, I know what that looks like. Um, and it looks like nothing that, at least in my mind, um, like everybody say, the people there are just, they're so different, they're so in love with us, and, and uh, it's where they always are like, please don't hate us, because I think the media over there really makes it sound like Americans don't like the Jewish people, and uh, we've you know, kept on emphasizing with them, hey, we love you guys, um, our last night that we went to a special <coughs> dinner with these kids that were IQs over 200, I think. They were intelligent kids. And um, they were asking a bunch of questions. And one particular, he was like 15 and three quarters, like, because they got to tell you exactly how old they are. Um, talking to him, and I said, You know, I said, At our church, I said, Our pastor, who's sitting over at a different table, um, or with us, you know, it always talks about pray for um, Israel. And uh, I said, and we do, you know. And he instantly just balled up, started crying, said, I have to leave. He came back, um, composed himself. And if we talked about it again, just about, you know, praying for, for them, praying for the kids, praying for the people, again, he would just ball up. He just was so moved by, um, I think, the love that we have for Israel. And I think we really need to show that more. And as Pastor Randy always tells us, to pray for um, Israel. Don't take it lightly. Um, they need our prayers. They want our prayers. And uh, it's such a blessing. And, and like Miguel said, you have to go. I know it's it's, uh, it's, it's a turtle of a lifetime. Start saving your nickels and dimes. Um, it'll come back tenfold to you for what you learned. <laughs> well, so, yeah, um, 
passion that's inside of that. It's because of that experience, man. Because he showed himself who he is to me. All the members on, on the, the team that were there, exactly who he is. Uh, it was a privilege to walk in his land. Uh, well, I said that the, the, the word of God becomes alive over there. I don't doubt that, but I know that I became alive mm-hmm. because of God's word. Uh, if there is any possibility in any way, shape, or form, for all of you, in one way or another, to get yourself to that goal, it is an amazing experience that you will never, ever forget. And I thank you, church, for the privilege of being a part of the team that's been Actually, I planned for maybe 10 minutes for that to take. Um, took about 
20 minutes. That means my sermon. Uh, no, no, we're going to stay just a couple hours. Don't worry about it. We're, we're, uh, okay. What a blessing, huh? Yeah. Well, I, I, we're not done yet um, because, no, you guys are done. Um, because one of the things that we got to do uh, when we were in the Valley of Allah was we read the account of David and Goliath because that's where that happened. And this morning, we're going to read that, the three of us. And so you can follow along if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Um, it's important because that impacted my life and all the people that were a part of that. And so we're going to do that now. Why don't you guys come over here? So, 1 Samuel chapter 17 says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sokoth and Askah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to land for battle? Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be one of our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man, that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel when were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in a battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistine, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for them. Then David said to Saul, let, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and, and he a man of war from his youth. Your servant used, used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from the mouth. And when it rose again, I caught it by its beard and stuck it, struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, would deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him, clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come to me and I will give you give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword, with the spear, with the javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, and the birds of the air, and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle of the Lord, the battle is the Lord, and he will give it into your hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Shamrin, even as Gath, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. Thank you. I wanted to read 1 Samuel 17 like that because as we entered into the valley of Allah in Israel, that, and it impacted my life because I knew that what God was wanting to do was to share with Calvary Chapel French Valley this important account. 
You see, this is an account. It's not a tradition. It's not um, something that uh, was just, oh, it's one of those things handed down time after time. It's a truth. It allowed David to defeat Goliath. And it did three things that you're going to hear about in just a few minutes. It demonstrated obedience. It allowed David to be an overcomer of Goliath, the enemy. And it allowed the truth of who God was to be told around the world. That was one of the purposes. So the Lord showed me this message and I want to share with you and um, I'm going to cut it short because we're um, short on time. Um, but uh, there are so many verses that can could be highlighted in this that would demonstrate to you who God is. A couple of them that I wanted to share um, we'll get to in just a moment. But what I wanted to share with you starting off is that it's, we battle Goliaths on a regular basis. It may be a thought. It may be some kind of desire. It may be an addiction. Or it may be a fear that is so big that we can't get through it. It's not a matter of if we battle Goliaths. It's how do we face them. David in Acts 13 was called a man after God's own heart. Paul said that about him. And then it follows up with that. And it says, it says that who will do all my will. That's why God called him a man after his own heart, because he was going to do his will. So how did David get to the point where he was going to fight Goliath? I mean, think about it. For 40 days, Goliath taunted Israel, made fun of them, laughed at them, succeeded in keeping them from going to battle. And what the Lord showed me was the enemy is doing that to us in our church and to Christians. Because the enemy taunts us. He laughs at our weaknesses. He strikes fear in our life. He keeps us from going to battle. We get diverted off of our focus of God. Paul said it this way in Romans 7:19, "For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice." You see, it's not about if we have Goliaths in our life, we do. The question is, how do we face Goliath? When the Lord spoke to my heart about um, sharing this message, what he was showing me was is that we need to prepare ourselves to face Goliath. They're coming. They're here. We've already faced some of them. And the question isn't about um, if. The question is, how are we going to face them? We're going to look at that through um, how, looking at David here. But... There are so many highlights in um, 1 Samuel 17. I just want to hit a couple of them. In verses 8 and 9, um, Goliath is very prideful and self-centered. In verse 26, David identifies the real issue, though. Goliath is defying God. And when you fight, when you have your Goliath, and you're fearful of that, it's not just the Goliath that is defying you. He's defying God in you. And the reason that I, that I think is important is we need to know who we are in God. In verse um, uh, 39, God provided the armor for David, not man. Saul tried to give David his armor, but Dave, uh, David couldn't handle that. He couldn't deal with that. So he went to battle with God's armor. Goliath, in verse 43, is self-confident. In verse 45, we see that David is God-confident, what I call God-confident. And in verse 47, David knew whose the battle was. It wasn't his battle. It was the Lord's battle. And then in verse 46b, it's the purpose of this account, this issue, 
is stated. And that, pur- that purpose ends up being that the whole earth will know that there is a God. That was the purpose of David facing Goliath. It's a similar purpose for us as well. But how did David face Goliath? I want to look at three reasons that David could face Goliath. Goliath. First one is that he was prepared. As a shepherd, David had to take on all the attacks from the lions, the bears, the marauders, all of those things that came after the sheep, David had to take on. And that's important to us because we should never underestimate our training in life. There are times when we go through things and we go and say, Oh God, do I have to go through that? We whine, we complain, and yet what God is doing is preparing us. You think about it. David um, knew that he was going to be delivered through his preparation. Having to spend time with sheep, you wouldn't think would be preparation. But look what happened when, when um, David had to defend all of the sheep. There's a purpose in everything that you and I go through. It's a purpose that prepares us for the Goliath. David knew that it was the Lord, though, that delivered him. In verse 37, he says that the Lord delivered me from the paw, the lion, and the bear. And then he says he gives credit to God. And we need to hear that. We need to understand that God desires the credit, not us. God doesn't expect us to face a Goliath without preparing us. And the question for us is, do we hang on to fears? Do we hang on to addictions or things that we think we can battle instead of giving it to the Lord? In first, uh, in Second Corinthians chapter one, one of my favorite um, ver- uh, chapters in the Bible, because what that first part of that chapter says is that God allows us to go through things, ultimately, so He can get victory, but then to touch other people that go through something similar. In other words, God tells us in 2 Corinthians, He's preparing us not only to get through the issue, but He's preparing us to help others. So if you ever go back and you wonder, why am I going through this? That's the reason. That's something that you need to be thankful for. David saw attacks as opportunities. You know, have you ever wondered why um, um, when an addict, an addict uh, comes to know the Lord, that generally, not always, but generally, they don't get immediately healed, even though they might be prayed for? Have you ever wondered that? Well, one of the reasons is because the process of getting healthy again is important to prepare people that have been addicted for something that's coming their way. In fact, you know, um, if you go to an AA meeting, and I've been to one, um, and there's a purpose for that, and I don't have time to share what that was, but um, I wasn't accepted there. But the person that I went there, who happened to be my son, he was not only accepted, he got to speak. I got kicked out. That process for him was so important to allow him to become the man that he has become. And what I'm saying to you is God is preparing you through the things that you go through. That's the first reason. The second reason is because of faith. David had absolute faith in God. He looked at Goliath from God's perspective, not man. If you look at your Goliaths from man's perspective, you're going to be intimidated. You're going to be frozen in a place that you don't want to be frozen in. So if we take the time, as David did, to prepare ourselves by spending time with the Lord and praying about things, what's going to happen is our faith is going to deepen. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Notice in that passage, it doesn't say, Faith comes by Pastor Rick's faith, or Debbie's faith. 
You see, I can't develop my faith because Debbie's faith is, draw, is drawing deeper. You, your faith cannot develop because Pastor Rick's faith is developing. You need to spend time with God. You need to spend time in fellowship. You need to develop your faith by concentrating on the Word of God. David knew that just as the Lord would deliver him from the lions and the bears, that God would also deliver him from Goliath. Is your faith a surface faith or a deep faith, knowing that God works all things out? You know, scripture that comes to mind is Romans 8, 20, 28, and it says, And we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But notice in this verse that it says those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that we become a Christian and our faith is already so deep that it's a Davidic faith. Developing our faith takes time investing in who God is. Facing Goliath for David required faith. Facing, facing yours and my Goliath take faith. The third reason I think that David could face Goliath is what I call he had God confidence. In other words, he had so much confidence in who God was and what God was going to do with him that he could face Goliath. It wasn't self or man confidence. It was God confidence. There, you, we see in our passage a direct contradiction between Goliath and David. Goliath believed in himself, his skills, his training, his bulk. Couldn't you just see um, Goliath... Um, taking copious amounts of selfies, standing on there. <laughs> I'm the greatest. I scare those people over there. Can you see that? Nothing against selfies. Well, maybe. Um, but that was self-centered for Goliath. It was something that Goliath thought so much of himself. Scared the uh, Israelis. But the problem was that Goliath had not gone up against David, who was God confident. David said, I come to you in the name of the the living God. I come to you in that name. He didn't say anything about, I come to you in my name, I'm going to beat you up. He said, I come in the name of God. So how could David face Goliath? He was prepared. He had faith and he had God confidence. And the question is, do we? Ultimately, do you truly believe that God is who he says he is? It's what it boils down to. Do we truly believe that God is who he says he is? Now, that struck in me three challenges I want to go over that we should be dealing with within our own lives. The first challenge to facing our Goliath is, are we obedient? You know, obedience is not just a thought or a concept. It's an action. And God calls us to be obedient. In that passage that we talked about, Acts 13.22, after God said that um, David was a man after his own heart, paraphrasing, it says, and he will do everything I want him to do. That, when you think about it, is his definition of obedience. David did what God wanted him to do. He learned how important that that was. For us, we need to be dealing with our obedience. Are we trying to do what God has called us to do? And if we're not doing that, your heart should be convicted. Because that's what David allowed David to go to face Goliath. In a survey done by Time magazine, it's a few years ago, it said that, that um, people, men and women, spent 18 minutes a day with their religion. Didn't say with God, but with their religion. That was before 
selfies. That was before iPhones. That was before iPads and all this other stuff that we had. 18 minutes a day isn't going to get it done. We need to be, find our obedience through our time spent with God, reading the Word, prayer, fellowshipping, um, all those things that Pastor Rick talks about pretty consistently. They're not just words. They're an opportunity to demonstrate our obedience. The second uh, challenge is, are we an overcomer? When David, when a Goliath confronts us, do we overcome like David did? Or do we cower in fear? Spurgeon said it this way, I charge you therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, who know the Lord, be up and in earnest to slay your lions and bears, that you may learn how to kill your Philistines. That is to say, serve God with your whole heart. Patiently bear the cross for his name's sake, so that when the time shall come for you to stand as a lone man for Christ, you may do it gloriously and may bring honor to your divine leader. Spending time with God is essential to become an overcomer, to be a person of, of, um, pr- of um, uh, preparation. The third challenge I have, because we are called to be an ambassador for Christ. In verse 46b, B, it says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That was the purpose of David and Goliath's encounter. We need to do that. We need to shout from the rooftops who Jesus Christ is. And the question is, do your actions, your words, your confidence, your praises tell those around you that there is a living God? Think about that. Do my actions demonstrate to the people around me that God is alive? David was offended that Goliath was defying the living God. Are you offended when those around you curse or defy God? Are you offended? The, the um, song Hosanna, sung by Hillsong, has a um, line in it that says, Break my heart for what breaks yours. Love that. And the question is, does our heart break for what breaks God? Does abortion that breaks God's heart, does that break our heart? 1 Samuel 17 challenges us to look inward, but also outward. Because it's so important for us to be obedient. It's so important for us to look upon ourselves as an overcomer. And it's so important for us to shout it from the rooftops. Real quickly, Deb and I were in Nias, an island in Indonesia, and we did a, um, a, a revival meeting. And after the meeting is 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and the Lord said to me, go up on that stage and, and um, shout the name of Jesus. What? Go up on that stage and shout the name of Jesus. And right at that time, somebody hands me a microphone. So went up on the stage and I said... Um, we need to shout the name of Jesus Christ. And so several thousand people um, were led to shout Jesus in a place that is really intense from a Muslim standpoint. God calls us to be ambassadors to shout the name of Jesus Christ. So as we walked into the valley of Allah... The Lord spoke to my heart this message. And I'll have to tell you, there's a whole lot more here um, that I'm not going to get to. But when we look at David and we look at Goliath, there's a lesson in there for us. And standing in that valley and looking at the hills on both sides, it was so real that we as Christians can overcome our Goliath. That we can do that because we are empowered by Jesus Christ. Our problem isn't that the victory is there. 
our problem is, is that we don't embrace the victory from God's view. Think about David, a young shepherd man who took on the fiercest warrior the Philistines had to offer and defeated him. He did it by being prepared. He did it because of the faith. And he did it because he he was God confidence. We have that same living God in our life. Are you allowing yourself to be prepared? Are you allowing yourself to develop your faith? And are you allowing yourself to become obedient and an ambassador? The account of David and Goliath has a strong message for each and every one of us. And I wanted you to hear as we read that, because just in reading the account, God should have spoken to your heart. And he did. And the question is, are you listening? God loves us. He desires for us to be prepared to go to battle. And a Goliath that is out there for you doesn't intimidate God. If you're intimidated by it, it's because you're looking from a man's perspective. Church, we need to look from God's perspective. Before we go into communion, I just want to pray. But I, I, I want to encourage you. Hear what the Lord has said to you today. Hear it. Chew on it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, what a tremendous blessing that it is to hear your word become alive to us. We pray, Father, that you would bless each and every one of us with an opportunity to know you better. And Lord, if there's anybody here that does not know you, we want to give the opportunity now for them to come into a relationship with you. If you don't know Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Lord, I accept your your free gift of salvation. I accept, Father, Jesus Christ as my Savior. I thank you, Lord, that you are the living God. In Jesus' name. Father, I just pray that you would touch lives this day. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.